when you're trying to bring the mind into concentration. There are two mental faculties that do most of the work. One is directed thought, and the other is evaluation. You bring your mind to the object. Or as they say in Thai, you lift the mind to the object, you lift the object to the mind. Which means that you make them both prominent, that you're here, right here in the present moment, and you're going to be with the breath in the present moment. And you want to emphasize the awareness and the breath, and try to keep them in line with one another. And then the second quality, evaluation, you look at how it's going. How is the breath going? How is the mind going? Are they staying together, or are they moving apart? If they're moving apart, what can you do to bring them back together and allow them to stay together with a sense of ease and well-being? Because that's the direction where we're going. Now, to do this, both the evaluation and the directed thought have to use a few other mental qualities as well. There's mindfulness and alertness. There's ardency. Mindfulness means keeping things in mind and remembering what you should keep in mind and what things you put aside for the time being. You have a couple of frames of reference you want to keep in mind. On the one hand, as you're focusing on the breath, you just want to look at the breath and make sure that you stay there. And if the mind slips off, you want to be able to remember, well, what have I been able to do in the past that keeps the mind with the breath, keeps it there? securely. In other words, if you've learned lessons through your meditation, you want to be able to bring them to mind. You don't want to forget them. And over time, this gets more and more instinctive and less verbal. You just have a sense that things are going well, things are not going well, just how they, by how they feel. But in the beginning, you have to be a little bit more articulate about it. You've learned that long breathing is easy to stay with. Okay, stay with long breathing. See if that works this time. And then if you find that it doesn't, you're going to learn something new. There are times when long breathing works and times when it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, what are you going to do? Try shorter breathing, deeper, more shallow, heavier, lighter. And this is where the evaluation comes in as you're checking to see what's working and what's not. The ability to evaluate things is really important. It's how you govern yourself as a meditator. But you can't have a teacher there right in your ear all the time, saying, now to do this, now do that. You want to be able to remember the good lessons you've learned. And if there are lessons you're not quite sure about, well, you file them away and bring them out and put them to the test. And you have to develop your own powers of observation to see, well, what's working and what's not, and how to know if something is working and if something is not. This takes time. And because it takes time, it also takes patience which is a quality that we in the West seem to have thrown away. At the very least, we don't develop it much. Patience, of course, requires equanimity and the ability to step back from things and watch them, not to identify closely with things that are causing you to suffer. That requires the mindfulness to remember that you have the choice. A feeling comes up in the mind and it seems really heavy, really painful. You do have the choice not to identify with it. You can identify just with a sense of, of the observer that's watching it. If you have no other techniques to use to counteract it, just be there watching, 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 and try to give that sense of the watcher at least one comfortable spot in the body to stay with. Because all too often when there's an 
uncomfortable feeling in the mind, there's going to be an uncomfortable feeling in the body to go along with it. And if you identify with both, you're going to feel overwhelmed. So you have to remember there are places you can step out. You can still be in the body in the present moment, but there are other parts of the body you can inhabit. You can still be with your awareness in the present moment, but you don't have to identify with all the thoughts going through. There's a passage in one of Ajahn Mahabhu's talks where he's talking about how after John Munn passed away he was feeling really lost. He was the person he'd gone to for advice for eight years now, and now he had nobody to go to advice for. What was he going to do? He began remembering some of Ajahn Mun's teachings, and one stood out. He said, if anything comes up in the mind that you're not sure about, it might be risky to believe it or to follow through with it, just step back and stay with that sense of the knower, the observer. Don't get involved, and eventually it'll pass. That's good advice for any meditator at any time. Something comes up in the mind, you're not sure whether it's good or bad, well, just watch it. If you have techniques to know that, okay, this is not going to be a healthy thing to follow through with, and you have techniques for counteracting it, then go ahead and counteract it. But if you're not sure, just watch. So after all, that's how the Buddha learned. He didn't have teachers to show him the way. He tried things out, and then he learned how to recognize when he made a mistake, and then he tried something different. And how did he know whether it was right or wrong? He developed the ability to watch. And as he was watching, he could ask a few questions. Where does this lead? And over time, you get a, get a balanced sense of what's skillful and what's not. The word balance here is really important. It's like the difference between logic and reason. You can follow a principle logically and carry it out to its logical conclusion, and sometimes it's crazy, totally out of balance, because you just take one thing and you run with it, and you don't stop to think, well, what other principles can apply here? Reason is when you balance the various principles that are applying. Again, a story from John Mahabhu, he talks about how he was really determined that he was never going during the rains retreat, never going to accept any food that didn't come directly from his own alms round. And he was getting very proud about it. And John Mun noticed the pride. And so every once in a while he'd slip a little food into a John Mahabhu's bowl. Because he was the teacher, he could do it. I was just pointing out, you hold on to one principle and sometimes another defilement springs up in its wake. So you have to be on the alert for that. Sometimes when you're really hard on yourself, you get proud. And there's also the problem of being really easy with yourself and getting proud about that. Reading recently about someone who was saying he's learned not to hold on to the arhat ideal and learned how not to hold on to the bodhisattva ideal because holding on, of course, creates difficulties and conflict. Then you get the sense he feels that he's higher than either of those ideals. Of course, the problem is he hasn't even gotten anywhere near either of the ideals. What's needed is a sense of when to hold on and when to let go. It's like being a carpenter. Sometimes you hold on to your hammer and sometimes you put the hammer down because you're going to have to pick something else up, a chisel, say, or a plane. And then you know when to put that down and pick up something else in its place. You know when to make marks on the wood that you're working with and then you know how to when the time comes to sand them off. And 
In Pali, this is called kalanyuta, having a sense of time. Matanyuta, having a sense of enough. Atanyuta, having a sense of yourself. When you're ready for something, when you're not. And although there are Pali words for these things, there's no clear-cut formula. It's something you have to learn with time. by being observant, noticing when a particular technique is helping you and when it's not, and what you can do in its place. You learn these things from other people and then by applying them yourself. And then if there's nothing is working, you say, okay, let's experiment a little bit here, which requires that you not be too eager to jump to conclusions. And with a John Munn, often he'd be off in the forest and he'd get visions of Davis coming in and telling me he should practice this way or not practice that way. It could be pretty impressive, a vision of a Deva coming in and telling you, trying to help you. But he would always test these things. He wouldn't immediately jump to a conclusion that that's the way it had to be. Everything has to be tested, and you have to train yourself to be a reliable experiment or reliable reader of what's going on. Again, patience, mindfulness, alertness, and the ability to step back. It's this way that you learn how to monitor your own practice, evaluate your own practice, which means, of course, that the principle of evaluation is not just something for the practice of concentration. It should cover all of the aspects of your practice. As you evaluate what you're saying, what you're doing, what you're thinking about, and the making adjustments is necessary. This is how you grow. This is how you mature as a meditator, as a person practicing the Dharma. So you can reach that point ultimately, as the texts say, that you become independent in the Buddhist teaching. In other words, you develop an all-around sense of these things to the point where you can rely on yourself to make the adjustments, to make the corrections you need. Up to that point, you need the example of others. To help keep you on course, because the mind does have its tendencies through the things it likes or the things it's averse to, or its fears or its delusions, to go off course very easily. This is why the, the Buddha set up the, the Sangha, so there's an apprenticeship. You not only listen to Dharma talks, you live with someone who's been practicing. So you can pick up that person's example. And when you've internalized the lessons, it comes a point where you are independent. But until then, remember, you still have things to learn. There's always that question of how to bring things into balance. What's the right time? What's the right place? If there's no teacher around, try at least to keep those questions in mind. What are you up for right now? What's the appropriate task right now? What should you hold on to right now? What should you let go? Try to be alive to these questions all the time, and that can help protect you from a lot of wrong turns, make it more likely that you're going to stay on course. <laughs>